Hello, we're here with Laura Marie Rivera, who is running for Seattle School Board District 4. Would you like to go ahead with your two minute introduction? Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Laura Marie Rivera. And yes, I'm running for school district uh, number four. I am early in this journey for school board and I, I don't believe it should be political and yet here we are. Uh, I filed on Friday and I got some lovely email invitations that evening and did my first forum and got my first endorsement yesterday. And um, I'm excited to be here today. I am a mom to four Seattle public school students and I have a master of science in education and leadership. And I've been teaching for the last 25 years. I've taught in public schools, private schools, um, museum education, uh, lots of dance schools and other informal settings. And oh, even uh, University of Washington when we first arrived here in Seattle. Um, I believe in transparency and policy, engagement with our communities, accessibility for all abilities, communication with families and holding space for our BIPOC voices. The kids and families in our district are all individuals and we need to be able to have some, some flexibility to treat them as such and reach them as individuals and educate them as individuals. I feel that a quality public education is the absolute best thing we can give our child and the best thing that we can give our society. So thank you very much for having me here and I look forward to finding out what you would like to know. Great, thank you. Uh, so now we'll move into the prepared questions. And again, these responses are two minutes apiece. I'll put the first one into the chat and uh, take it away, I believe, Katie. Great. Um, what policies will you seek to ensure that all students, regardless of gender, race, class, disability, or ethnicity, receive an education to reach their fullest potential? What would you do to advance anti-racist and in an indigenous curriculum and promote racial equity in SPS? I think that's a fantastic question. And I love that our district is doing such a good job of highlighting these issues and bringing them to the front. And I believe it goes back to the individual point of our kids. They all are individuals. They're coming from different places. They have different lived experiences. And just because someone is of a similar socioeconomic background or the same race or the same anything else doesn't mean that they're the same as the rest of the group. And it's just Again, coming back to individuals and you mentioned curriculum and I absolutely believe that we need a better, more inclusive, uh, competent curriculum. And it's not just BIPOC voices and indigenous voices, it's everything. Our kids are uh, not as worldly as they could be. And with, with the internet and all the other tools at our disposal and especially the technology here in our area, there are a lot of things that kids need to be exposed to. And there's, there really shouldn't be an excuse, but we, we need to create more well-rounded individuals. Thank you. Great, thank you. So now I'm gonna put question two in the chat and uh, take it away. So, yes, go ahead, Sherry. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I, I missed my part. What would you do to advocate for ample and equitable funding for K-12 education, including special education, um, school nurses, counselors, mental health professionals, and paraeducators? Um, students in special education continue to not receive education that <clears throat> they are morally and legally entitled to. How would you ensure that students, educators, and schools are supported both with policy and funding. So that's a great one. It's, it seems silly to say that there's not enough money or there's not enough funding or we need more. And at the same time, it feels like we do. The, the, the system of property taxes and where the money goes and how, how it's allotted is, antiquated and it's it's set up uh, with, without equity. And um, it's, 
I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, it's set up without without equity, and uh, the money stays where the money is, and it's it's not fairly distributed. And you mentioned nurses, and uh, at last count, I heard Seattle Public Schools was allotted nine nurses, and there are over fifty thousand students in Seattle Public Schools, and I'm pretty sure everyone, every grown adult should be able to do the math and know that's not enough. And I know at some of the schools, the PTA raises money and pays for the nurse. And I think that's great. I think it's great that there's a nurse and that they're paying for it. I just think it's appalling that uh, it's, not, it's not part of the budget. It's not part of the plan. It's not something that they're working toward. And some of these things need to be solved, not only within Seattle schools, but within our region, our state, our country. The, the way the funding is going and the way it's allotted are not, it, it's not always going to the best place. And part of the job at the board is the oversight. And this is a, a very big budget and they have a lot of big work to do. And it seems like we need to be working in coordination with the other groups so that we can get it right. Great, thank you. Uh, question three, uh, Laura. For several years, directors and leaders have said that SPS's enrollment projections were significantly flawed and coming off of a year of online school. The concerns regarding enrollment projections and budget loom large. What will you do to ensure the district accurately projects enrollment and school budgets for the 20? 21, 22, um, and in the future? This one goes to flexibility. And uh, it's, I'm, I'm pretty sure everyone agrees that the numbers are inaccurate. And I'm also pretty sure that there isn't anyone that has guessed or projected the correct number. So it'll come down to who, who is signed up and who shows up. And of course, that leads to a lot of churn uh, in the schools in the beginning of the district. I know that at uh, my children's school, they're already allocating the funds for next year and they don't have enough students for all of the things that they need. And it goes back to, you know, will they, will they have an assistant principal? Will they have these other things? And without that number of students, they won't. And uh, the school is scrambling, looking for the last 25 kids to enroll at school so that they will have those magic numbers. And the truth is, it, it doesn't particularly matter if those 25 kids are coming, but they need them on the, ro on the roster. And in truth, as the summer comes, a lot of kids will have moved and a lot of kids will have come in and a lot of parents that didn't enroll will realize school is starting and show up at school. So it's, it, it comes down to flexibility because they need to, of course they need to plan, of course they need to budget, but then when you see who shows up, you also have to make adjustments. Great, thank you. And question number four, Layla. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> Do you support SPS continuing um, option schools such as language immersion, STEM, STEAM, international baccalaureate, um, project-based and other opportunities at specific schools, do you support continued transportation for K-8 to students to such option schools to offer families equitable public school choices? I absolutely do. Uh, these, it's just what I'm talking about with flexibility and individual needs. And, you know, each, each student needs different things. Each family wants different things. And the opportunities that some of these specialized programs provide are amazing. And they may not be things that all families want, but they are also things that can open up doors for all of these kids. And I'm so glad that it is no longer STEM, but we actually acknowledge STEAM and the arts. I've had a lifetime of uh, performing and teaching and visual arts. And the way that those things cross over and work into your everyday life, it's rather maddening when people then ignore it or want to cut the funding or anything else. Uh, you think about this pandemic and we've been home alone a lot and tell me anyone that has not been listening to music, who hasn't been attending things online, who hasn't been uh, binging all of their favorite TV shows. None of these things would happen without the arts at an early age. 
And for all the kids that are succeeding in the immersion language and the international baccalaureate, it's amazing. And I definitely support continuing those things. And a very important support of that is accessibility. And we cannot have that if the kids can't get to the schools. It's wonderful if you have a mom or a dad that's gonna drive you and pick you up or anything else. And of course, in high school, they get the ORCA card. But until then, we have to have a way to get the kids to the programs that they need. Great, thank you. Uh, so now we'll move into the follow-up questions and these are at uh, responses one minute apiece. And uh, if you do have a question, board members, please go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, give folks time. I have a whole list prepared, so I like to let other people have an opportunity first. Go ahead, Sherry. Hi, um, <clears throat> I'm just curious um, what um, qualities um, and um, oh, can't think of the word qualifications will you look for in a permanent sub, uh, superintendent? Uh, well, I would like our permanent superintendent to be the be all end all for all of our students and families. And I think that's a really tall order and I recognize as much. So the short list would be open to families and communication and open to changing their mind when we realize we've made a bad choice or something new comes available and uh, kind of that flexibility that I've been talking about. And also I prefer organizations with structure and I would like someone that will sit and lead and set the example and bring everyone else along with them, if that makes sense. Great, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and let another board member in. And uh, while doing that, I'll ask the next question. Um, let's see. What, um, let me, uh, what do you see as uh, the board's uh, role and responsibility? So officially as a more of a governance board, uh, it's, it is a, a little bit more of a passive thing, but I think that our board has taken a much more active role. And I think that that is a wonderful dance between passive and active and trying to set policy and setting those goals and the curriculum. And I, I think that they've made some wonderful work um, advancing equity and certainly getting it to the top of everyone's mind. And people are looking and people are listening. And for better and for worse, people see Seattle and see what we're doing here. And I would also like to see the best, the best practices and the best reason so that um, all of the kids are having the best education going forward and hopefully be a leader in the country. Great, thank you. Other questions, board members? We have more. All right, I'll ask the next one. Um, let's see, one of the other ones that I had was from uh, somebody in our membership and it was talking about like, how would you manage to um, serve in this role uh, in this public position um, while it's, it doesn't really, it doesn't pay anything, doesn't have a whole lot of support, you know, how do you uh, plan on managing that? Uh, that is a fantastic question and I appreciate it being asked because a lot of people don't realize that. And um, it is, sometimes I say comical and sometimes I say just sad that this is such an elaborate, an elaborate process and through the general election and an expensive process. And again, this is to run for a volunteer position. And I think it's shameful, shameful uh, that the board needs to be paid. If it's a job that needs to be done, it needs to be paid. And if it's a job that we don't need, absolutely phase it out. Uh, you can't really have it either way. And for a district and a city and a region that speaks of equity as much as we do, uh, again, there's zero equity 
if you are expecting people to go through this process and give this much time and energy and effort for no pay. And it's very obvious who, who can do these things and who can afford to do these things. And there is no possible way that we're going to achieve equity without compensating the board. Great, thank you. Layla, go ahead. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, why are you running to be a school board member? <laughs> um, you know, I get that question a lot and I can't say I have a full specific dialed in answer. Right now, it just, it feels like something that needs to be done. Obviously, I believe that we do need a board and um, the job will go to who shows up and who does the job. And uh, when the interim position came up, I started thinking about it, knowing full well that it will be given to someone who is there. And the same thing for the general election. And so I promise, what I consider myself as the voice of reason and uh, in, my, in my other pages, I talk about listening and um, I may not always agree with you or anyone else, but I promise to listen and bring those ideas and voices with me. And um, that is definitely what I feel that I can bring and also give of myself the opening up the curtain a bit more. And I know we have a lot of communications from the district. And as a parent, I am bombarded with emails from the schools, the district, everywhere else. But it, there's so much that goes on when you do attend those board meetings that parents have no clue about. And it's about trying to break that down and make it more accessible for everyone. So just as a follow-up, were you, um, I know that there was an interim position were you one of the finalists for those for that interim position or? Yes, I was. And for the interim position, uh, there were, uh, yes, there were, there were a handful of candidates and uh, the board voted for the interim position. And uh, it was only the six current board members that had a say in that one. And if you look at the community feedback, uh, the overwhelming support was somewhere else. Thanks, I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions? We have one more, we have time for one more. I got, all right, I will ask the next one. Um, so how would you contribute to a successful board meeting? How would I contribute to a successful board meeting? Well, if you have, you, I don't know if you've ever attended one, but they tend to be long and boring and I don't plan on bringing interpretive dance to a board meeting. And yet, um, there's a lot that goes on there and a lot of information. And so when you are able to pass and everything is clear and kick it along, I think that's great. But I've noticed that there's not a lot of, um, there's not a lot of communication happening within those meetings. It's more of a question or maybe even a follow-up, but then they move straight along and, at the end of the meeting, they vote for what they were already gonna vote for. We have people in the community signing up to speak. They, they come in, they testify either in person or in Zoom. They testify and they're trying to make their voices heard, but it doesn't feel like it's crossing the table. And they end up voting for the position that they had before the meeting started. And I think that's really unfortunate. We, you have to have you have to be willing and open to hear other things. And you also have to have the freedom and flexibility to change your mind when, when you realize that perhaps there was a better way. Great, thank you. And that, with that, we're gonna go ahead and ask you to give a one minute um, wrap up. All right, well, uh, for my one minute wrap up, I'm just gonna go with grace and gratitude. I appreciate you all giving me this time and I have come to appreciate uh, the more, the further I get involved and the more people I meet, it is absolutely heartening to see so many people giving of themselves and their time and talents. And sometimes when you're detached, it doesn't feel that way, but I, I really enjoy seeing the people that are committed and showing up and doing the work. And I appreciate people that give me a bit of grace when I need a minute to think things through or to think them better. And uh, it's just been a wonderful learning process and I look forward to serving for our kids. Great, thank you so much. Thank you.